Thank you, brother. Um, I'm positively nauseous, so uh, thank you for that, I guess. But I guess that means you did your job uh, right tonight. Um, a comment first. If I'm not mistaken, I don't know the statistics, but isn't it often the case that uh, those that have been abused later in life often become abusers themselves? That is a fallacy. Okay, so... It, it's a statistical fallacy. While there are those, uh, and, and maybe even by the help of a mental health clinician, will connect and, and create a narrative for the reasons why they abuse, if that was true, then we would have to, there would be a, a whole lot more sexual offenders out there. The, the reality is there are, the majority of people who are abused do not abuse. Okay. My only point in saying that was Sorry. that, <laughs> no, that's, that's good news, I, actually, um, to the extent that um, saying something and speaking up for the abused impacts not just their lives, but so many lives down the uh, in the future, and that's that's true no matter how you look at it. Uh, my question is this: um, You mentioned, and rightfully so, that uh, the police need to be involved, the authorities need to be involved when things like these happen. But uh, as we all know, sometimes the authorities aren't always the quickest at their job, just because of the amount of evil in the world, um, and sometimes they, despite evil having been committed uh, may not prosecute or may not um, seek out justice in that way. So my question is, in those moments, either in the in-between moments when we're waiting for a verdict or in the post moments when there is no verdict, um, how should we respond then to both the offender and the victim? Just to make sure I understand, I'm just going to restate what you just said. How do we respond to the offender and the victim in cases when the police are dragging their feet or there's a, a, a length of time between when they've been arrested and conviction, et cetera? Yes. Well, it depends. And I think each case may be different, but in the same way that when a parent, when, when their child has a bad dream and uh, their first response is not to uh, analyze the dream, but to comfort their child, then I think for those who've been abused and they don't understand what's going on, we can be very proactive about their healing. That healing spiritually includes a lot of prayer, a lot of, uh, well, I don't, can I say fellowship? A lot of time together with safe people. It also includes interacting with somebody who has some sort of training in trauma recovery. Maybe that's a, a counselor or a therapist. Maybe that's a, a sister who's been through it and kind of knows the things to say. But I wish I could say there was a one size fit all. It's going to be different each time. But as long as we're taking active steps instead of just waiting, that waiting can turn into festering. Hey, excellent job. And I just wanted to reinforce a couple of things that you said. And at, as at Sulphur, you said it, you felt better when people agreed with you. So I, I agree with you. I'm just saying these things to reinforce and get your comment if you have any. Um, I just want to reinforce what you said about reporting because I can speak to that from a nurse's standpoint and as having had to do that in the church. Um, one of the things that I had to do with the, in the church scenario was to then explain to the leaders of the church why I reported. I didn't go to the brethren and tell and ask them should we report i just reported it to the police you don't have a business meeting and discuss reporting you do it and then you explain to the brethren why you did it one of the th things that i told them and i had to verify this for the state of tennessee was it's a class e felony they did not understand that when they understood that you can be prosecuted fined, and imprisoned for not reporting it and there are people in the community where I live, uh, church organizations where that's happened, they got and they understood um, how serious it was and, and there wasn't really a problem. Um, I'm pretty sure that's every state. It's a class E felony, at least. The other thing was something I've not really heard about. You talked about the reputation of the church being affected and people say, you know, you're blowing up the church. It was interesting when I talked to the detective at the sheriff's department, 
how he was very praiseworthy of what I did. Of course, he's a law officer, but I think most people in the community were worried about the reputation of the church. There's a sexual offender in your church, but because it never gets reported, you look really good for reporting sexual abuse, in my opinion, and apparently by local authorities where I live. So I feel like people need to stop worrying about what the community thinks for reporting the abuse as if it's a negative thing. Um, and then lastly, I was asked by the brethren to come up with some type of sexual misconduct protocol, and it helped me to understand these three parts. If you did want to come up with some protocol, uh, official or otherwise, to come up with some type of a plan and at least discuss prevention of sexual misconduct, reporting sexual misconduct, and then um, a attendance. What are you going to do with this person in terms of attendance? When they Are they going to come back to church? And you, you address those um, and the different options. Thank you. The, what I'll add to what you just said, I don't know about your state, but Texas has a code that shields those who make a CPS report. Um, I'm trying to find where it says it specifically. Well, maybe I won't find it, uh, but you're shielded from libel lawsuits if you make it in good faith. Now, if you're going because you want to ruin the reputation of someone and then it's discovered that's what you did, and then you, you can be sued in court. Uh, but sometimes people are scared, well, I don't, maybe I don't have all the facts, and so I better not report it. Well, there's laws to protect you if you just even have a breadcrumb for the detectives to work with. A couple of books that I would recommend by Bill Anderson, When Child Abuse Comes to Church. This is a man who took a post, and four months into this post at a Baptist church, it came out that somebody in the um, kids' education center had been molesting over 40 kids. He wasn't there when it happened but he stepped into a ministry that was preparing for that to go public. So he talks about that experience across the year. Their congregation lost members when they publicly disclosed, but then regained different members from the community who saw a church that was willing to stand up for them and wanted to be a part of that. So you're absolutely right. I think here we are afraid that what will the reputation of the church be if we admit there's a problem? Meanwhile, there's people out there that are, go that are crying out for justice. And when we offer justice as part of the gospel, and they want to be a part of it. Bill Anderson, when child abuse comes to church. Just a couple of follow-up comments. I mean, there are thousands of sexually abused people in our communities, and if they see that, how empowering would that be for them to want to join your church? But um, the other thing was, I forgot to mention, on the insurance side of things, insurance policies for churches are void if you knew about sexual Absolutely. abuse and you did not report it. So... Um, you might as well consider yourself guilty <laughs> when it gets found out by your insurance. I'm glad you said that. I had it in my notes to say for those that just, they can't imagine not inviting that brother back. My, that was my other suggestion is you need to disclose, at least disclose it to the families to make a decision. And you need to call your insurance company and cancel your policy because you will no longer be insurable. Is it not against the law for a convicted sex offender once they're released, isn't it against the law for them to be in the presence of their victim? I'm not a lawyer, and that sounds reasonable. I also understand that there's exceptions to those for in uh, certain zones, like a religious place, but I, I don't know if that's around minors only or about their specific victim, but we're also talking about people who are convicted, but then what about all those who aren't convicted, and they still are around the ones that they abused? Thanks for that, Jonathan. Good stuff. Um, regarding the question Austin brought up about does sexual abuse people turn around and abuse others, uh, Salter talks about that in Predators, and she said this comes from self-reporting from inmates who have every reason to lie and to twist the narrative. And when they started lining these guys up and saying, we're going to put you through a lie detector test, a lot of them started recount, recanting that. And once they sent them through the lie detector test, the numbers diminished to negligible. That's a false narrative. And it's what predators use all the time to make themselves look like the victim. Uh, there's an acronym people need to be aware of called DARVO. It means um, deny, attack, rever reverse, abuse. I mean, re re yeah, reverse victim and oppressor, DARVO. And the idea is that uh, 
sexual predator is going to deny, deny, deny until they can't deny anymore. Then they're going to start attacking the person who has proven that they are what uh, they're that they are a predator, and then they're going to try to reverse who the victim is in the situation, who the oppressor is. And it's very difficult to deal with a manipulative, deceptive person, which is the definition of a predator. Um, I had to sit down recently in a situation with a young girl who was disclosing with a couple, she was going to disclose to a couple of church leaders. The church leaders kind of knew what was coming. They asked me to come sit in and she had written out her testimony and she had a soft version she wanted read before the church, and then she had a hard version. And she read the soft version, and she said, here's the hard version. And the soft version was pretty soft. And one of the brethren at the table, he's an older gentleman, he says, oh, we, don't have, we don't have to read that. We don't, we don't have to know what that is. I said, I'm going to read it. And he was kind of surprised. I said, if you're going to advocate for someone, you have to know what's happened. And as uncomfortable it is as it is to your statement, reading it is not near as bad as having to live it. And we have to imp be able to understand what they're dealing with. When you have a person who confesses, quote unquote, but refuses to turn themselves in or refuses to cooperate with an investigation, that is not repentance and confession. And it should not be accepted by church leaders other thing I want to say, people have this idea that when a person is molested, that there are really two options or there's two natural reactions. You either flee or you fight. But the most common reaction is to freeze. Mm -hmm. And when a person freezes, that is a natural reaction that people need to be aware of. And you can't say, well, they froze. That, that means they must have wanted it. No. People have this idea that um, if you do not give verbal rejection, then you have consented. That is not a true concept. And people don't take into account the concept of the abuse of power and the power dynamics role in abusive situations. We have to consider those factors. For what it's worth, there is a podcast called the Speaking Out Against Sex Abuse Podcast hosted by Jimmy Hinton and his mother. It went for about 250 episodes and recently stopped, but I think out of 250, you can stay busy for a while if you want to find out some good information. Thank you. I agree with what you said. The only thing I'll add is for those who have not experienced this and you think, I don't know if I could read that or if I don't, I don't know if I could be uh, helpful in that simply by showing up, even if you don't have personal experience with it, by showing up and sitting with the best thing that Job's friends did was show up and be quiet for seven days. If that was the end of the book, it would have been a great book. It still is a great book. But That was great, Jonathan. Or, yeah, Jonathan, sorry. I forgot your name for a second. Well, you call me Doug. That'd be a compliment. Doug. So yeah, I'll take <laughs> uh, I have a question that, that maybe, maybe everyone will think is kind of strange. But uh, I think many of us in this room can remember a time when the law uh, enforced things that it doesn't enforce anymore. In fact, it's a complete turnaround. Uh, we've watched that in the, all kinds of things, but in the moral, in the moral realm in particular. Now, I'm vaguely aware that there is a, a a political constituency out there that would like to see all these laws off the books, uh, and they seem like their voices get louder as the years go by. And at an earlier time. Such a thing seemed unthinkable, but then so did other things that are now perfectly accepted. I just wonder if you have any comment you can make about how influential or to what degree, I don't really know how to frame the question. Uh, is, it, is it out of the realm of possibility that at some future time, what we're expecting the law and the state to uphold will not uphold anymore. Uh, I just wonder if you had any thought about that. I know it's kind of out of the realm of most of the questions, but I'm just curious about that. Since we have you fellows here that kind of have sure. this knowledge, so. Well, I wish I could offer hope 
and say, no, it'll, there, there will always be some sort of protection, but there's nothing new under the sun. And if we know from Genesis and Judges that a society became so depraved that they would take advantage of and, and abuse and kill, should we expect no less of what could happen here? Now, I, logically, I, I don't see it happening that way in our country. I, I always see those who would be shocked and cry out. But there's nothing new under the sun. And 10 years ago, I don't know if we would be having a debate over whether or not somebody could change their gender identity. And yet, these days, that's a very common conversation. So where will it be 10 years from now? I don't want to monger fear and just say that uh, we're going to be living in, in Sodom or Gomorrah. But George has preached about the book of Revelation and what Babylon is. There's a lot of times that I feel like I'm living in Babylon. So there's nothing new under the sun. And yes, I think we could see that laws, if certain groups were put into power, could be changed. And we might be advocating not for the, the civil law, but for the moral law of why we need to stand up for the oppressed. Thank you, Jonathan. A uh, very, very good talk. Uh, Nathan's as well this morning. Um, could you elaborate uh, or explain a little more uh, about our obligation when uh, someone, and uh, I started to use the word confess, but it is a, as a victim, it wouldn't be confessing, but rather confiding uh, in church leadership about abuse that had taken place. I understand the legalities of what you were saying when it's an on an active abuse relationship or it's a minor, but what about the scenario of someone who is an adult, uh, who's a functioning adult, and, and I don't mean you know emotionally unstable or anything, but they have come to uh, us as a church, as leaders for uh, confidence, and they don't want to confront or right. expose or do anything. Is there any obligation or legality that we are involved in for someone coming to us and saying, yes, I was abused as a child sure. by so-and-so? Um, that might be somebody that we knew might be somebody church, might be somebody we don't even know that's uh, you know from their past, their childhood. What do we do with a scenario like that so that we're not caught in some type of a sure. legal quandary there? That's a good question. There is a statute of limitations. I, I mean, states might have different things. Nathan might actually be able to speak more about that law specifically. And sometimes people don't want to pursue legal action. They, it was 30, 40, 50 years ago. They're just They've been carrying around this pain for so long. They don't know how to function, so they just want to tell you about the pain. And I think that's a worthy response for us when they disclose. They're, they're not interested in, maybe they forgave, or maybe they've let go of that, but they're, they're struggling in other areas of their life based on what happened. This is where we ought to, in addition to spirit and truth, public assembly worship, be part of congregations that also have times where friends are getting together, uh, dare I say, small groups are getting together. And these are places where people feel very safe and comfortable to disclose some of these deep issues of the heart. These are the times when addiction issues come out, I think in a healthy way. It's where trauma comes out in a healthy way. And it's where healing happens in a healthy way. Okay, so there's nothing as far as legality, as far as the legality that we should be concerned about, is what I'm ascertaining. I don't from know what your statute of limitations saying. in each state. Okay. At the very least, you could inquire with your local police department, and they could advise you on what the law is. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Sorry if I didn't answer the question. Just kind of rambled. That's what I feel like I'm doing right now. Jonathan, thank you very much for your presentation and for what you've chosen to do. Um, for you to be able to care and then say, I'm going to get the education and I'm going to put my life toward helping others in this area, it's tremendous and I appreciate 
you being there very, very much. It's a great service to your community. It's a great service to the brotherhood. If we have statistical proof, you said one in three females by the age of 18, one in six males by the age of 18 have been abused in some way, then what we hear among us, I'm guessing, is not conforming to the real statistics, which means we under-report drastically. So as we are getting ready to go to the New Year's meetings, and we look out at this vast crowd, and we saw, see all these wonderful young people, we many times have no idea the burdens they are carrying. Mm -hmm. So in my anecdotal experience through the years, I've had people who are between the ages of 20 and 30 who have asked to speak to me to reveal things that happened to them when they may have been five. And could you address a little bit more as to why it takes that long for someone to be able to say anything. And then I have follow-up from that, please. Sure. I practiced a standard response for questions like this, and I will now deliver it. It depends. Let me qualify that. I think some of the most shameful, fearful, unbearable experiences are that of incest. And there's something particularly unbearable for somebody who has been abused by a parent or a sibling or an extended family member that there's no way that anybody will ever believe me because the person who has authority over me, if they've done this to me, who can I trust? Mm -hmm. And so they carry that for decades. I gave this at home. I gave it a couple of other times uh, just in practice, right? Several conversations across several different places. And when somebody who's in their 70s tells you that their grandfather abused mm -hmm. them and they, it wasn't until they were 50 years old where they could talk about it, I tend to believe that shame and fear are two of the most hideous things that live in the head of an abused victim. And they simply have convinced themselves that nobody will believe them because this sort of thing shouldn't happen. And then when someone is brave enough to say something and they are ridiculed by those they trust to be in charge of their lives spiritually in their congregations and their abuser is touted as someone who must be protected at all cost and the poor person who's been abused is wadded up and thrown out like the garbage what about leaders who have decided to live with those types of things and how they're going to lead the congregation in the future when someone else is abused in their congregation? And is there any wonder that among us the reporting is not what it should be? And how do we help leaders in congregations to do what they're supposed to do? Well, we do what we're doing right now. It deserves every moment that we give it and 10 times more. The victims who leave the church, whether that's because nobody believed them or because they're confused and they pursue different lifestyles because of the, what the abuse triggered within them, I think are some of the greatest tragedies of our brotherhood that we let them go. We ought to be telling people to worship with one cup and one loaf. But I would like to tell you something definitively. If you worship with one cup and one loaf, 
and you do not advocate for the helpless and the oppressed, and you permit those who abuse to receive all of the spotlight of graciousness, then your one cup and one loaf is meaningless to your salvation. You're lost and you need to repent. The one cup and one loaf is not meaningless. Don't hear that, please. It's the only way I want to worship. I want to worship in spirit and truth. But God's prophets and priests and kings of old, the ones who were supposed to do what was right, they get caught up in the grandeur of the gold of the altar and lose sight of the most precious thing that was supposed to go on it. I feel extra rambly right now, and I'm sorry that my answers maybe aren't as precise as they ought to be. Um, I would like to read this quote to you from a book. It says, Maybe churches need to teach people how to listen and not panic when someone falls apart in their presence. The struggle is, if someone would talk to me about what I was experiencing during the church service and someone observed that I was falling apart, their first reaction might be to panic. And the message that the church needs to send is, teach people not to panic. The second case that I ever dealt with as an intern was a case of incest and abuse and molestation. And as a boy who was very sheltered growing up to hear this for the first time, my eyebrows probably were on the back of my head because I was in panic mode. How am I supposed to help? How am I supposed to fix? Don't ask those questions. Maybe it's time to just sit for a while and let somebody tell their story and to say to them, I hear you, I love you, and whatever we need to do to make it right, I'm going to walk through this valley of the shadow of death with you. I don't know how much this answers Brother David's question, but you can correct me if I'm wrong on this. When we talk about mandatory reporters, we're talking about we're mandated to report the abuse of a person under the age of 18. Is that correct? Or someone who is no longer able to care for their own body. Yes. So that would be the elderly yes. and the mentally incompetent. So when you have a 20 year old, when you have a 20 year old come to you, this is a story that they have some say in how it gets told as opposed to someone under the age of 18, something to think about. Um, but in those situations, I encourage them to speak up. I encourage them to file the police report because there is a high, high, high probability that there are other victims. And that doesn't necessarily dawn on them when you talk to them. They think that they're the only one. Maybe they've been told that they were the only one. And then years later, they find out that they weren't. weren't and now they have compounded guilt because they feel like they were responsible for some of the abuse that took place because they didn't report. It's always okay to report. And to your point, they're not destroying families. Sin is what destroys the family and the church, not the one that does the reporting. To your point, one of the greatest needs it seems people need is to be heard and to be believed. They're not looking for money. They're looking to be heard. One of the w most wicked things I think I may have heard come from a church leader's mouth is, well, you know he's a homosexual anyway. Why does this matter? Speaking talking, about talking a victim, about victim. Talking about a victim. We don't, the idea was we don't, have to, we don't have to advocate or help him because he's a homosexual. Now, I'm not, I, I'm not saying it's okay to be a homosexual, but I am saying it is wrong to cast people off and to not connect some dots of how they got to where they are. I want to read a passage from Ezekiel 33. Though I say to the righteous that he shall surely live, yet if he trusts in his righteousness and does injustice, none of his righteous deeds shall be remembered, but in his injustice that he has done, he shall die. Again, though I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, yet if he returns from his sin and does what is just and right, 
If the wicked restores the pledge, gives back what he has taken by robbery and walks in the statutes of life by doing by not doing injustice, he shall surely live, he shall not die. We do not believe in a merit system where my previous righteous deeds outweigh the wickedness I have just done. When a righteous man, regardless of how much righteousness he has done, when he cre commits vile acts of wickedness, his good does not outweigh his bad. We still have to deal with the consequences that come with the wickedness we've committed. That's right. I agree. Alex Wilson. Uh, isn't it true, Jonathan, that <clears throat> since the Bill Cosby events and the Me Too movement and all of that, that a lot of these uh, statute of limitations laws have been expanded? especially with reference to ministers sometimes. I, I don't have any in, I think knowledge that's true. of that. In a lot of places, the statutory limitation is 10 years, but for ministers, it can be 30. So people do need to report or be encouraged to report, even if they're over 18 when they finally speak. Thank you. There have been several emotionally charged ideas for consideration today, but I will say that one's, this one's hard, <laughs> you know. So the question that I had actually pertains to exactly what the brother here was talking about and uh, the brother David in the back was also talking about. For someone who has not really considered the statistics and even really thought about what that would look like in dealing with that in a church scenario. What would it look like in a situation where a statute of limitations has been passed, but the situation comes up, uh, comes up for a church's consideration like, you say we're not called for investigation, you know, that's not our job, that's not our duty. Where do we balance the idea of that statue of limitations with the fact that sin has been committed and what would be, in your experience, I mean, you've had more time to think about this than I have, a reasonable course of action for a congregation that finds out about this past the legal precedent that the people who should be taking care of this, can. If I understand your question right, I, I would simply say it never hurts to talk to a local police department or detective about it just to, to be informed. It's been referenced earlier, uh, a, a, a group called Grace, Godly Response to Abuse in Christian Environments, and so they will know the legality forwards, backwards, better than we will. Uh, Jimmy Hinton, who wrote the book, The Devil Inside, also has training materials. And you, for like a couple hundred bucks, can buy eight hours worth of abuse training, get your volunteer group together, and they'll be able to answer the question better than I just did. Going from zero and completely ignorant to going to being informed doesn't take that much. And, and my suggestion would be that... Uh, the more that we can delegate helpers, the less burden that you're carrying all by yourself. And I'd love to see congregations where, I mean, in the places I've given this afterwards, I've had women and men come up and say, sign me up for that. I wanna be, I wanna be on that group. That's great news. I think it's, it's very encouraging after these presentations for people to say, that's something that I can be involved in. Let's get creative in that regard. And if I'm off, I know maybe some have a different view than I do about uh, groups getting together or whatever, but if I'm off on that fr from your view doctrinally, then let's get creative on how we can do it in your view doctrinally so that people can start advocating for one another and get trained and educated. Yeah. To those who've been abused, you will not be forgotten. We believe you, we support you, and we will change. I don't want to be so melodramatic as to say this is, you know, the issue of our time. 
But I do believe that if we are a church that has restorative intent, we want to be the church of the Bible. We want to restore New Testament Christianity. Part of that restoration is justice. It's not relegated to one day a week. It's every day of the week. And a restored church is a church that supports the oppressed. To those who abuse, to manipulate, or enable, you will be exposed. You will be opposed. Repent forever more and give this up. And to those who can do something about it, let's get to work.